I'm fascinated to hear. I've, I've, not, I've, heard, I've heard a lot in the last few weeks about the post-truth era, but I didn't realise that the post-truth era coincided with the pre-factual era. Uh, and actually, you're quite right. It's really, uh, it is really interesting that we are in a position where we do know pretty much that something's going to happen, uh, but we don't know the character of it and the, uh, and the shape of it. And the rather scary thing, I think, is not only do we not know, but no bugger knows. We are in the situation now where I pretty, pretty firmly believe that there is hardly anybody in this country, and certainly nobody in the government, who has a really pin-sharp picture of the way that this process will play out. And while I think that that might be a fairly common position when a country goes to war, I think it's probably unprecedented uh, in peacetime, that there is no absolutely clear plan of what will happen, and there is no real uh, certainty of what the quality of the outcome will be other than this rather generalised uh, statement that Brexit means Brexit and that we will leave the European Union, presumably given that we're going to trigger, it is said we will trigger Article 50 uh, by or on the 31st of March 2017, you have to assume that the first day or the day that the UK and there's a two-year period, you have to assume that the day the UK will actually leave the European Union will be the 1st of April, 2019, a date deep, deeply symbolic, it seems to me, uh, in the whole process. Let me tell you a little bit about what I think may happen. Uh, I'm drawing here on the fact that the, the FDF, the Food and Drink Federation, is uh, very heavily involved in the negotiations, and the well, there aren't any negotiations yet, but the discussions about how Brexit will be framed. Uh, and I'm also in the position, uh, fortunately, I think, though I may review that statement in a couple of years' time, uh, where I'm the chairman of the Food and Drink round Manufacturing Round Table, which brings together 37, yes, I really did say 37, trade associations across the food and drink sector uh, trying to represent a wider group of companies than my individual members, who are about 300 of the uh, food and drink manufacturers, you, almost all of the larger food and drink manufacturers, and a swathe across uh, small and medium-sized businesses. Um, 30, the 37 trade associations, incidentally, does have a little bit of a feel of that moment in Monty Python's Life of Brian, where you encounter the People's Front of Judea and the Judean People's Front, it's not entirely clear why some of these associations exist separately. Ancient enmities are played out around the table, usually, something, usually the result of some mischief or miscreant activity by a predecessor of mine. Uh, probably somebody did something that somebody didn't like in about 1942. Uh, and so we do have a rather fragmented uh, situation. We're also, of course, in the, in the, we're also in one bit of the chain. So the chain for us starts with farmers and growers, and they're substantially represented by the NFU and other farming organisations. And we sell to uh, out-of-home sector, which is itself incredibly fragmented, but partly represented by the British Hospitality Association, and obviously to retailers substantially, but not exclusively represented by the British Retail Consortium. So those are the major players in the, in the representative stakes in the Brexit debate. Um, now, I'm going to ask, uh, if I may, I'll ask you to wave at me when I've uh, had my 20 minutes because I'm not very good on timing and I've lost, I haven't got my watch. Uh, so let me just start by saying what I think, and I'm going to come around here because I'm feeling a bit, a bit us and them. Let me start by saying what I think will happen. What we know will happen is that it's the Prime Minister's aspiration to trigger Article 50 in the first three months of uh, next year. Why does she want to do that? Well, she's under a lot of pressure. She's a Remainer herself, if only a reluctant Remainer. And she needs to demonstrate to those in her party who were ardent leavers 
that she has the zeal of the convert and that she is prepared to go through with this uh, act uh, and therefore she needs to start it as quickly as possible. She's sort of taking her cue from Macbeth, if t'were done, t'were best done quickly. Uh, whether she will be able to do that is a good question. Uh, I was with, uh, this morning, her two most senior business advisors, and they are utterly, utterly unmovable on the fact that Article 50 will be triggered by the 31st of March. The main barrier to doing that <coughs> is now the courts. Uh, and in fact, it's the Supreme Court, uh, or as I will call them for the rest of this talk, the Supremes. So the Supremes get to have their say next week. There's a case brought by a lady called Gina Miller, who says that Parliament must vote on the decision to trigger Article 50. Uh, that position was sustained in, uh, in the High Court a few weeks ago, somewhat to the government's surprise, it's clear. Uh, and indeed, the Lord Chief Justice and the Master of the Rolls, the two most senior judges in England, said that the government's case was baffling and lamentable. So you would assume, though not necessarily for certain, that the Supreme Court is unlikely to overrule the most senior judge in the country on the basis of such a strong judgment. It's not a given. It could be done. But it seems somewhat unlikely. So it looks as though Parliament will have a vote on this in the first few months of 2017. But there's an additional uh, complication which has come up in the period since the High Court made its decision. And that is that there have been applications from the parliaments of Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland to be parties of interest in the hearing. The implication of the fact that the Supremes have allowed those to be heard is that there is at least a case to be made that the Scottish, Welsh, and Northern Irish parliaments and assemblies will also have a vote before Article 50 is triggered. If that is the case, Artic I can say with almost complete certainty that Article 50 will not be triggered by the 31st of March because the Prime Minister can get a vote almost certainly through the Welsh Assembly. They voted for exit. She can probably get a vote through the Northern Ireland Assembly, but it is almost impossible to believe that she will get a vote through the Scottish Parliament without some quid pro quo uh, demanded by Nicola Sturgeon, which is almost certain to have some... Uh, it'll either be one of two things. It will either be special status for Scotland in the post-Brexit post settlement, or, worse, it'll be a second referendum on independence as a consequence of the uh, Brexit. Neither of those seem to me to be very likely to be acceptable to Mrs May, and therefore I think we may see, if the court agrees that the Scottish Parliament has a say, there may be a, a period of turbulence, a period of even more uncertainty. I may be conspiratorial, but I'm not absolutely sure that that would displease Mrs May in private as much as she might say it would displease her in public. Uh, because it seems to me that the longer that, that, that Mrs May's whole career, and let's face it, this has worked for her because she's Prime Minister, has been one of great caution, one of great thoughtfulness, one of great uh, precision in her decisions, but also an element of playing it for time. And this would give her the chance to play for time. So I don't discount the fact that she won't be overly dis disappointed by such a decision. It's not certain that decision will be made. If the decision is only that the UK Parliament has a vote, then I think we will see both Houses of Commons, both House of Commons and the House of Lords, vote to trigger Article 50. Although I wouldn't be so sure uh, about the vote in the House of Lords, uh, where the government has no majority and where basically almost anything could happen, as I would in the, in the Commons. So that's the, that's the timetable. There'll then be a two-year period of negotiation. What is emerging from our discussions in the last week for the first time, and this is the reason I don't have a presentation, because every time I write a presentation, it's wrong. Um, what's emerged for the first time in discussions we had yesterday with the number two at the Brexit department and this morning with the two, parliament, two government advisers is that the government appears to have, and, and this is in, in, implicit in what uh, we heard from David Davis, it looks to me as though the government has decided that a transition period is pretty much inevitable and probably desirable. And in a conversation I had with a senior minister who is right at the heart of this the other day, 
he seemed to me to be talking about a five-year transition during which the UK would stay as a member of the customs union but, and would pay, for, uh, pay the EU for access to the single market in some form. The one thing that will not happen, I think, and the one thing that, or rather, the one thing that will happen very quickly is that the UK will move in the direction of control on the free movement of labour and on immigration. The politicians on all sides have interpreted the Brexit vote as essentially one about immigration. That's very, very difficult for our industry. We have 400,000 workers in the industry in manufacturing, obviously more in uh, both upstream and downstream, uh, in retail and in farming and growing. Of those 400,000, 120,000 are non-Irish, non-UK Europeans. Uh, they are facing, because of the currency, already facing a 20% cut in their, the value of their wages if they are here to send remittances home. And we know that about one in eight of our companies are now recording people going home. Excuse me. The difficulty that causes is that they can't be replaced or not easily replaced because very few people will come here without certainty on the future uh, of, their, of their time here. And the government isn't in a position to do that until the negotiations start. Although we believe that labour and the security of tenure of labour in the UK will be the first item of business in the negotiation process and will pre will will come will come to a decision and will be announced way before the rest of the negotiation. So labour certainty is a big problem for us, and as you saw, um, uh, one of the issues driving price rises in the UK at the moment, as a consequence of the currency uh, devaluation, is that labour cost will rise because it's scarce. Labour costs will also rise, incidentally, here in the spring because of the apprenticeship levy and the national increase in the national minimum living wage. So that's all driving prices up, and that's why you saw the remarkable uh, consistency between Justin King and Ian Wright on that film. I have to say that Justin knew what I'd said and found another justification to get to the same number, uh, but 5 to 8% is about where we think it is, and we have also uh, agreement on that from Mark Carney, the governor of the bank. So labour is a big issue for us. So too is, uh, so too is the long-term future of labour, and I'm very worried about the way in which that will work because there will be a limit on the number of people who can work here from the EU. This won't apply to Irish nationals, by the way, because, as you, I'm sure you know, Irish, the Irish rights are, are guaranteed under other acts of parliament. But the EU workers are critical to us, and there will be fewer of them. And it, it, there is a, a pr presumption and a, a perception amongst government ministers that the food manufacturing industry is, in some way, low skill. Now, we know that's wrong. Actually, most European workers who are here in the UK are actually quite high-skilled. Uh, and certainly, the majority of them are either highly skilled or semi-skilled. And we're having to spend a lot of time trying to change that perception at the moment. Uh, I think we will succeed. We've got some good uh, material to demonstrate that. But it's a big concern for us. Because if that is the perception, when they come to set the quotas for the number of workers from each industry, or set up the point system that will be used, the serious danger here is that food and drink manufacturing will fall behind financial services, will fall behind automotive, will fall behind pharmaceuticals, will fall behind even football managers. Uh, under the point system. And there is a real problem that we have, which I think is a, a legacy of, of the failure of this industry to talk a good game over the years, that, that ministers would r really would far rather do uh, photo calls with hard hats than hairnets. Uh, and we have to get away from that perception that the industry is in some way inferior to these other manufacturing industries. It is, after all, the largest manufacturing sector in the UK, bigger than automotive and defence combined. So the labour issue is a key early priority for us. The second issue that we're worried about and we're addressing in our discussions is the whole question of the regulatory framework that we inherit. Now, I can go into great detail on this. If it's something that interests you, I'm very happy to answer questions on it. The key, que the key issue is that the regulatory framework will be repatriated, or in fact patriated, to the UK in what's called the Great Repeal Bill, which is the thing that May, Mrs May announced at the Tory party conference. 
at the moment, what the government is saying is that there will be a kind of lift and shift attitude to this, that all the legislation that is currently governing uh, from Europe, and in food, everything is an EU competence in the UK, will be brought over, and then we'll edit it at our leisure later. I have a concern about that, I must admit. If I see that every big company has lawyered and advised up in this country, every company has now got legal advisors coming out of their noses in terms of the way in which they've, they've appointed people, those lawyers are going to do something. And the thing they're going to do is advise that this particular clause of that bill could be better if it was changed. And you'll have NGOs in there as well looking for consumer protection opportunities. So I think that's, that, that stage of lift and shift is at risk, and I think that's a big problem for us. The final piece of the jigsaw for us is the trade and tariff negotiations. I am, I am, as a consequence of my belief that they've now decided they will have a transition, I'm going to finish, uh, uh, that they will have a transition deal, I'm a little less worried about the trade and tariff discussions because I think, I think they've realised that this is going to take quite a long time and the intention is that the five-year transition will in fact give them space to start negotiating the key uh, free trade deal, which is the one between the UK and the EU. So that makes me a little bit more optimistic than I was 48 hours ago about the way in which this is going to pan out. I'm very grateful to you for inviting me today, although I do think it's quite funny that I originally accepted an invitation to a reception um, and, uh, and possibly even an after party at the Marylebone Hotel. Um, and I've ended up singing for my supper. Um, but uh, I'm very delighted by that. I, I could, the one thing I'm going to finish on is this. The one thing I say to every meeting I have with ministers and government is, Ireland is the most important issue to solve in the Brexit debate. Because, as we've heard, uh, it, it, it encapsulates all of the issues. There's the trade, the, the labour, the regulatory barrier. I used to work for Diageo. The milk in Baileys goes over the border five times before it makes it into the bottle. We know that that cannot be, it cannot be a hard border and preserve the, the fantastic working relationships and integration that the two islands have had over the last 40 years. If the government can solve Ireland, they can solve a lot of the Brexit problem. So I think you will see quite a lot of attention on, on the Irish-UK relationship over the next few months. I think they understand that it, it is, is the crucial emblematic way of resolving this. Uh, I have to say, though, that in many of these questions, they are so complicated that they couldn't be answered by Stephen Hawking on speed. So the possibility of them being answered in the time we have is, is one that really worries me. Thank you for listening, and I'll be very happy to take your questions later.